You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie in Massachusetts. And I'm Johanna, talking to you from Austria's wine region. And you are listening to Fresh Hell, your favorite international podcast. That's right. For our new listeners, welcome. We're very glad you've found us. We are online friends from different continents who have never met in real life. One day in 2019, we had the idea to start a true crime podcast. And here we are, <laughs> more than two years later. And we are still absolutely amazed that anyone other than our immediate families is listening to us. We just hit an incredible milestone. Thanks to you, our listeners, we just realized that we have hit 1 million downloads. I still can't <laughs> believe it. And it's very typical for us that we actually missed it. I have to explain. To our podcast, you can either listen to us via our your podcast app or our webpage. And in the first year or so, we only had our webpage. And so we always have to sum up all of our numbers to know our actual download statistics. Yeah, there's some addition there. And so I said to Johanna, I said, I think we might be getting close to a million downloads. And maybe we should do some kind of lead up to it or something. And she was like, I'm gonna do the math and get back to you. So she gets back to me and we missed it. We passed it. We are now at 1 million, is it a million 11,000 or so, somewhere around there? Mm -hmm. And that's all thanks to you. So thank you so much for your ongoing support, your ratings and reviews, and thank you for recommending us and sharing our content with people that you know will enjoy it. Yes, thank you. We definitely wouldn't be still doing this podcast without each and every single one of you. You're the best. Now... Without further ado, let's get into today's case once more. This one takes place in the early 1900s. I kind of like these cases. I don't know why. I'm drawn to them. I like them too. And it takes place in Germany. And it is a very brutal murder fueled by greed and anger. And I will be talking about mutilation, so please be warned. The other thing I have to say is I didn't find too many sources for this one. The most helpful was from the book Interessante Kriminalprozesse, so interesting criminal cases. I think it's volume two by Hugo Friedländer. That's the book I also used for the Lucy Berlin case already. But even in this book, there is no mentioning of the victim's first name, for example. I tried to find it somewhere, but I, I just couldn't. So I will only refer to him as Lieutenant Colonel Rose. So that's not out of disrespect. I just really, I don't know what his first name was. I don't know what Colonel Potter's first name was. Well, I do, but I still love him. So I think that's okay. It sounds good to me. All right. So here we go. Now, I've talked about other cases that were set in Germany and Austria in the early 1900s, and I will not be going to recap how life was in those places back then. If you want to know more about it, you can listen to the episodes about Lucy Berlin or Fritz Hamann, for example. Now, this story takes place in Mönchengladbach, which is a city in the west of Germany, close to the Dutch border, very close to Cologne and Düsseldorf. It's just a 55-minute drive from Cologne to Mönchengladbach. Today, the city is home to 260,000 people. The population started to grow after World War I, but really kind of exploded after 1975. But it's not so much because many people moved there, but just because smaller towns were incorporated into the city. Right. Does this happen in the States as well? I think so. There are a lot of parts of Boston. For example, I lived in Jamaica Plain for a long time. Well... For several years. And Jamaica Plain is... So you could write me a letter to my address on Center Street and you could have addressed it Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts or Boston, Massachusetts, and it would have gone to the same place. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? There are quite a few areas yeah. where it's like Jamaica Plain is its own... I'm having some brain fog, but yes, I think that's the same sort of thing where it's the greater area. Everything kind of grows together, yeah. right? Yeah, I think... I'm sorry, I'm having my brain isn't great today, but I think that makes sense. So we're traveling back to the year 1905. Um, back then, the city was still called Münchengladbach, which I, it might sound exactly the same to, to American ears. I don't know if you can hear the difference. Uh, can you say the two again? <laughs> Mönchengladbach and Münchengladbach. Well, it's the Munch versus M Mon Munch and Munch, right? It's different. <laughs> 
It's a diff- it's a different vowel kind of sound. Almost, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a ö now and it used to be a ü back then. An umlaut? Is it a with the dots? Yeah, it's always a umlaut. Yeah. Exactly. I love an umlaut. And back then, roughly 50,000 people lived there. I looked at a couple of pictures and it looks like it was a nice place to live in 1905. Wide streets, flanked by trees, enough space, not crowded and dirty like Berlin, London or Vienna, for example. Mm, That does sound nice. So there was a man living in Mönchengladbach in 1905, a retired lieutenant colonel with the last name Rose, and he was 46 years old and had retired early due to problems with his nerves. Now, we talk a lot about these old cases, and when you read a lot about those days gone by, you start to decode things, or kind of decode things, like soldier retired because of nervous problems. Mm. I think uh, I tend to assume that it was some form of PTSD, right? That's certainly what I would assume, you know, when you hear of, yeah, nervous problems. And then later, of course, it was what, shell shock? Did they use that term yeah. over there? Yeah, I would say PTSD, maybe an anxiety disorder. There just, there really wasn't much in the way of mental health at that time. So yeah, I checked what kind of wars Germany fought in the times that he would have been an active soldier. Mm. So in 1905, he was retired. That would have been around 1880 to 1900, maybe. It was too late for the French-German war, but who knows? There was so much going on. They were in Africa and, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure where he served, but he retired early because of his nerves. Could it have been his actual nerves, like MS? Do you know what I mean? Could he have had a nerve problem or do you think it was mental? I don't think so, no. No, I don't think so because, well, it could be, but it doesn't mention anywhere that... He had physical problems, gotcha. just Yeah, that makes sense. So it must have been, yeah, it must have been a PTSD or an anxiety yeah. issue, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, as I said, he retired from the army and he lived in a very nice house. I mean, house, probably a mansion, as it is described in Mönchengladbach. He was married, but his wife lived in Paris. I don't know what was going on there. Uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter to this story. Well, maybe it matters a little bit. Because I think back in those days, the wives would be the heads of the household stuff. And I'm just strictly talking about upper class households, right? Right. The lady of the house would hire and fire the help. Yes. Yep, that makes sense. So he was living alone, though. Yes, he was living alone. So Lieutenant Colonel Rose's wife was in Paris, and he was the one responsible of hiring someone to help him around the house. He found a housekeeper, an elderly lady named Mrs. Blömers. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe his wife had hired Mrs. Blumers because I read that she was working for Rose for quite a while already. I can't say for sure, but I mean, what do I know? What I do know is that Mrs. Blumers didn't get any younger and that taking care of Lieutenant Colonel Rose, the mansion, the garden, it all started to become a little bit too much for her and she was looking to find another job, one that wasn't as physically demanding as this one. And now Rose had to find a new employee, but Mrs. Blumers already had a solution. The retired officer should simply hire her daughter-in-law, who was an experienced housekeeper, because she had already worked in several houses and all her former employees were praising her work ethics and character in their letters of recommendation. And because of those recommendations, and because Rose knew Mrs. Blumers for such a long time already and trusted her, he did hire her daughter-in-law, the young Mrs. Blumers. I think... I think the fact that Adolf Blömers, so that's the son of the older Mrs. Blömers, he had served in the Dutch army. I think that was also a plus. I think that if you have spent half your life in the army, you tend to feel comfortable around other members of the military or even ex-military, right? And I think you also, I don't know how... Want to support each other? No, I, it's more of a you trust Oh, sure. If you spend so much time in the army and you know about their code of course. Of ethics, maybe, yeah. that you trust them more, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Also, in my experience, people who have spent any significant time in the armed forces have very strong views on the way beds are made. <laughs> if you can't bounce a coin off that bed, is it even made? I don't think so. Try again. <laughs> So the young Mrs. Blömers and her husband, Adolf Blömers, they moved into the servants' quarters downstairs at the Rose Mansion. 
Now, at the time, they had been married for roughly five years and they had two children. And I don't think that the kids also moved with them to the Rose household. I think uh, that was also not that unusual at the time that your kids would stay with relatives or grandmas or aunts and uncles because you had to earn a living. I guess it's still not unusual today and there is no shame or judgment from me for doing what's necessary to make a living for you and your family oh. as long as everything works out, I guess. Yeah, definitely. I, You know how much I enjoy cruising, which I know is not for everybody, but one of the things I love about it are meeting the people who work on the ships and they're from all over the world and they leave their families for a good, you know, a better wage than they would have. It's a really common thing to still go away to work and have other yeah. family help help with your children. It takes a village, right? So they moved there and everything was fine, at least in the beginning, because the money Mrs. Blömers or the young Mrs. Blömers earned as a housekeeper for Lieutenant Colonel Rose was not enough to support a young family of four. So Adolf needed to find a job and Rose, who was described as a nervous and sometimes quick-tempered person, was also said to have been ready to help people in need. And yeah, I think he was actually a kind person, but you know how back then, if you didn't know anything about mental health issues mm -hmm. and somebody is maybe quick-tempered or gets angered easily, you kind of dismiss them as a bad person. Sure. He's a curmudgeon, but maybe a lovable curmudgeon. That's a good word. It is. So Rose, he, he really... He wanted to help people in need and he tried through his connections, to get a job for Adolf Blümers. And he managed to get him trial periods in a couple of places, but ultimately Adolf was never hired. And when Rose asked Adolf, you know, what's going on? Why can't you, why didn't you get that job or this one? There was always something, always some issue, and Adolf always painted himself as the innocent victim. But after a while, I think Rose got kind of suspicious. He didn't trust Adolf Blümers' words too much anymore. And so he asked the possible employees, you know, why didn't you hire out of Plumas. And the answers were always pretty similar. He was lazy and unreliable. Now, let me tell you this. <laughs> there are two character traits that most army officers don't appreciate, and that's being lazy and unreliable. <laughs> so we can imagine Lieutenant Colonel Rose was already a little bit miffed, but it gets worse. In the meantime, Adolf's brother, Leonard Blumers, had moved in with the Blumers uh, there in the servant's apartment downstairs. And Leonard was out of a job as well. And he promised the officer that he was only going to stay until he finds a job. He's really sort of being taken advantage of now by this family. He's got a lot of people I think so as well. moving into his house all of a sudden of the person that's supposed to be taking care of him. Yeah, and so he promised that he was only going to stay until he finds a job. And now Rose is trying to help both brothers, but... The same. Both brothers couldn't keep any of the jobs. It looks as if both brothers were of the, you know, they were not interested in honest work, apparently. It's so strange. You, uh, Yeah, I feel really bad for Ruse. That's a crummy situation to find yourself in. Now you've got like a house full of strangers <laughs> that you're trying yeah, to help. And, and Just one of them is working. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot. It was a lot and Rose had... He just had enough. And not only had he not two lazy dudes living in his house, as you said, he must have also felt kind of embarrassed to have recommended them to people he knew. And I totally get that. Imagine you try to help a friend get a job. Okay, the Blumers brothers were not his friend, but they were the sons of a trusted and reliable woman he had known for a while. So yeah. I mean, the thing is, y you say they're not friends, but they're literally living with him. So it's like, it's more than just an acquaintance, isn't it? It's more, yeah, but I mean, it's still an employee-employee kind of relationship. Yes. Less than friends, more than acquaintances, yeah. I'd say. It was just really nice of him. Yeah, he's trying to help them, and he recommends them to people he knows, people in his social circle he talks them up a little bit probably you know hey this guy is really great and just do you have a job for him and then he realizes that they have a horrible work ethic i would feel so, so bad and kind of embarrassed as well yeah of course i would say that's very embarrassing absolutely so lieutenant colonel rose is pissed 
and he tells Leonard Blumers to get the fuck out of his house. And this pisses off Adolf Blumers and his wife as well, because how dare these men criticize them? It's not their fault that nobody wants to give them a chance. You know, we all know this kind of people. Everything that happens is always somebody else's fault, and they don't ever think they are responsible for anything in their life. Mm-hmm. And they probably think, what does Rose know any way of being desperate, out of a job, out of money, and almost homeless? Because he's well off, right? Sure. And that's when they have an idea. Rose is very clearly rich. He must have a lot of money hidden somewhere in his house. They just need to find his hiding spot and take the money. Because with a few thousand marks, they can start their life, you know, maybe open a business. And we already know that it never works out because people like the Blumers brothers don't just need a bit of money to finally start their life because they never change their attitude. But I know I'm preaching to the choir because we all know these kind of cases. It's always the same. Oh yeah, we all know these kind of people. Exactly. But the Blumers, they want to find the hiding spot of Rose's money because in their mind rich people all just have their money lying around at home. Obviously. I mean... So much money. Where are you going to put it? <laughs> In the mattress. Yeah. So one day when Rose is out of the house, they go upstairs to his apartment. I mean, the audacity, first of all, to do that. Right. And they start snooping around. And of course, they find nothing. They find a little bit of money. And Rose will be back soon, so they can't search more. But surely the money has to be somewhere. If only they would have more time to find it. So they have very clearly have to get rid of Rose, so they form a plan. The brothers think it would be best if Adolf's wife would put poison in the lieutenant colonel's tea, because that would do the trick. But the young Mrs. Blumers is like, where am I supposed to get poison? If you want me to poison the man, you can go and get me some poison. I'm not going to walk around <laughs> asking for poison, and that's it. Good for her. Fair enough, the two men think, and they make their way to close by Düsseldorf. The city lies 33 kilometers or 20.5 miles east of Mönchengladbach. Hey, uh, at least they are smart enough to realize that it's probably not a good idea to walk around in your hometown shopping for some poison, right? Right, agreed. Yeah. They try a couple of pharmacies, you know, they just walk in there ask for some poisonous substances. But each time they were asked for a certificate that proved they were actually allowed to purchase these substances, I guess there were this kind of jobs that you could hold where you would need these substances and were allowed to purchase them. Sure. So every single time they have to mumble up some excuse, leave the pharmacy, because obviously they did not have such a certificate. After a while, they decide to return to Mönchengladbach, so they come home empty-handed. On their way home, they had talked themselves and each other in quite a rage. How the pig had to die tonight, and they would just do it immediately when they returned home. So the <sighs> Blumers brothers return home, angrily walk up the stairs, and stand in front of the officer's door getting cold feet. So they stomp downstairs, sit down at the table with the young Mrs. Blumers, and open a bottle of wine. And together, they hatch a plan. Oh boy. The thing that I'm amazed at here is we've gone very quickly from let's find the money in the house to he has to die. Yeah, and exactly. The other thing that's so strange to me is Mrs. Bloomers is the housekeeper. So if they're looking for money, can't she just look for the money while she's cleaning the house, I presume, that she did the cooking and cleaning, right? Who are these yeah. people? I mean... Not not the brightest candles in the chandelier. Who are these people? Yeah. It's almost like they wanted to kill someone and need an excuse. Yeah, maybe. Okay, sorry. I just can't get over the audacity. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And I know so far this story might have almost sounded a tiny bit comical. Up until this point, I actually pictured them... A little bit like the wet bandits in my head. Yeah. But this case doesn't end in a funny way, quite on the contrary, because now it will get absolutely horrendous. So the Blumers brothers are so enraged with Lieutenant Colonel Rose that they have decided to kill him. All this because he didn't want to have two do-no-goods in his house. He thought probably one do-no-good was enough already and he couldn't kick out the husband of his housekeeper, right? The next day... 23rd of October 1905, that was a Monday, Adolf and Leonard go down to the basement, they have hammers and axes with them, and they start to make an 
unbearable racket. They used the tools to bang on barrels, pipes, the walls, and it must have been an insane amount of noise. Now, remember, Rose had bad nerves, the reason why he retired early. I personally usually don't have bad nerves, quote unquote bad nerves, you know what mm. I'm talking about. Yeah. And I would absolutely freak out over this kind of noise. You know, oh, yeah. This kind of noise was basically the reason for me to flee the, to the countryside and leave the city. So yeah, Rose storms out of his apartment, stomps downstairs, opens the door to the basement, you know, standing on the top of the stairs and yells down for them to stop this nonsense immediately. Then he slams the door shut, returns to his rooms. But the two hoodlums start over again even louder. They bang and they storm and they yell. Rose now hurries down the stairs once more, opens the basement door again and yells down, stop it. But they do not stop. They keep making noise. Now Rose has had enough. He walks down the basement stairs to tell them off face to face, but once he reaches the bottom of the stairs, he is hit with a first heavy blow with a hammer. Many more blows follow, but the officer is a tenacious man and it takes many blows to his head to get him on the ground. Once Rose is lying there motionless, they hear the doorbell ringing. Adolf and Leonard sneak up the basement stairs, close the door to the basement behind them, and then they hide around the corner while young Mrs. Blumers opens the entrance door. Who can it be? A police officer is standing in front of the housekeeper, and I think that's a moment where most criminals would probably pee their pants a little bit, or worse. <laughs> but yeah. not Mrs. Blümers. But she stays completely calm, and she asks the police officer, well, what might be the matter? And the policeman informs her that he's here to deliver a note to Lieutenant Colonel Rose. She answers that the master of the house is not here. He had to go away on a trip to London. So the police officer hands her the note and tells her to give it to Rose as soon as he returns. Then he turns around and walks off. Wow. Yeah, just the coincidence. That whole thing sounds like a scene out of Clue, right? Like, it feels like if <laughs> you'd written that into a book or a movie today, the producers would be like, no, that would never happen. Mm. But here we are. Yeah. Wow. Life is stranger than fiction. It is. So now they have to get rid of the body. They discuss how to best do this while walking down to the basement again. And all of a sudden they hear the officer yelling for help and banging on the door. He's not dead. Adolf and Leonard are shocked, but Adolf's wife tells them, you did a bad job and now you have to finish what you started. The Blumers brothers grab the next best thing they find lying around, which are heavy plaster stones. They open the door, and as soon as they see Rose, they start throwing the rocks at him, aiming for his head. Jesus, poor Rose. After a couple of hits, the victim goes down, but he doesn't stop screaming. Leonard runs upstairs to Rose's apartment and grabs his army dagger, and with it he starts stabbing Rose several times, all the while he's cursing his victim, calling him a pig and an asshole, and that that's gonna be the last day of him uh, annoying them, things like that. Mm. But as I said, the military man is tenacious, he is still alive. Barely, but still alive. They can hear his rattling breathing, gargling. Probably, I guess, from the blood filling his lungs. And Ugh. then Leonard steps on Rose's neck while Adolf gets a saw. And now the brothers start to cut off Rose's head while the poor man is probably still alive. Oh, this is horrific. This is... All right. So I f this is... It's like a real horror movie now. This mm. is terrible. At least later in court, the murderers are unsure if they could still hear him trying to breathe, and even the coroner said he can't he can't say for sure if he was dead or alive when they started cutting off his head. Hopefully he was at least in a place where there was... Yeah. You know. Mm. So the horrible deed is done. They remove the head from the body, next the hands, because they heard that this way it will be almost impossible to identify the body if he's ever found, also because he's wearing a gold signet ring... Of course, the criminals want it. So they simply cut off the finger. After they finish dismembering their victim, they walk up to his apartment to look for the hidden money. And they really take their time, but there's just, there's nothing. All they find, um, it's 300 mark in a drawer, a little bit of jewelry, and Rose's wallet with 35 mark. And I checked, and one mark from 1900 apparently would be 6.7 euros, so 335 marks would be 2,245 euros or 2,665 US dollars. Uh, of course, I know all of you out there want to know, well, Johanna, but how much is it in horse money? <laughs> I think that 2,500 roughly is more like cue the Sarah McLaughlin music because you can sponsor a horse for only 
20 cents a day. It's that kind <laughs> of money. I don't think you could like responsibly purchase or care for a horse with that amount of money. So that's not even horse money. They did all of that, that horrific, awful crime for it's not even horse money. Maybe maybe a very small heirloom quality carpet, but very small. Yeah, it's not nothing but far from what the murderers had hoped to find. I think I also read that for one mark you could buy a, a two pounds of butter. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's yeah, a lot of butter. You have like 1,200 pounds of butter, roughly. Now so. I'm hungry. Um, but yeah, <laughs> no, it's... It's, I'm just appalled, and we see this all the time, this is nothing new, but mm. this is one of those cases where what was done to a person for what reason is just, when it's, like you said, when it's greed, it's just, it's so appalling, and they didn't even get anything. Not that there's an amount that would have made it okay, you know what I mean? Yeah. But like, wow. And it's also, of course, such an overkill. Yes. So there was so much anger there for just just because he criticized them basically yeah. for not wanting to work. So after dark, the three packed the cut up pieces in suitcases and sacks and they load them on a cart. And the three of them pull the cart out of the city and into the area around Viersen. So that's a town roughly 10 kilometers or 6.2 miles north of Mönchengladbach. And there in an isolated spot, they bury the body parts. Then they return home. And apparently Leonard had returned at least one night, maybe even several times with a lantern to see if the burial spots were undetectable. The very next day after the murder, people already start to ask for Lieutenant Colonel Rose, so the mailman, for example, the neighbors, and the baker's apprentice who delivers fresh rolls every morning. And the housekeeper tells all of them that Rose had to go on a trip. And there is one important detail or question, rather. When did young Mrs. Blumers inform the baker's apprentice about not needing to deliver more bread? Because the apprentice testified that it was on Friday the 20th of October, so three days before the murder. But during the trial, the housekeeper denied this accusation and says she only informed everyone after the murder had taken place. She even wrote a letter to Mrs. Rose informing her that her husband had decided to travel to London. How is that not suspicious? Yeah, I would say that what this group lacks in work ethic and morality, they make up for with greed and and just chutzpah. It's, mm. it's... I mean, imagine you, you live abroad... And Paul is home with his housekeeper. And then one day you get a letter from the housekeeper, not your husband, your housekeeper, the housekeeper informing you that Paul had to travel to Newfoundland. Yeah. And you're just like, okay. It's so bizarre. Yeah. The whole... And I think, I th yeah, I think uh, Mrs. Rose did actually find that very suspicious as well. Of course. Yeah. These people, honestly. And it was not only Mrs. Rose... Several people started to get a little bit suspicious and Mönchengladbach was not a huge city, remember. People definitely knew Lieutenant Colonel Rose, at least people in his circles. And rumors started to spread. And the rumors made their way to the police. And I think also Rose's brother had contacted them because uh, he was worried about his brother and the whereabouts. Apparently he had searched his brother's apartment for any clues and found that several suits were missing. I don't know how that was a red flag for him, because I think it would have been normal that suits would be missing if you go on a trip. But I assume that he just knew his brother, and maybe it was kind of... I don't know. He figured out that the retired officer never would have taken these suits for a journey. He would have taken the other suits, you know? Yeah. That's interesting that his brother would know that, though. Although I think people had less clothing at that time, didn't they? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, he was also in the army. Maybe they were quite close. He was also living in the area. I don't think he was living in Mönchengladbach, but very close by. The police started to surveil the three Blumers, because obviously they were kind of the suspects here. And wouldn't you know it, they didn't have to tell them for too long, because soon enough they started to pawn off some of Rose's belongings, his jewelry and expensive furniture, maybe even some quality heirloom carpet. Who knows? Who can say? So the police sprang into action and the first bloomers they could grab was Leonard. And so they brought him in for interrogations. At first he played tough, you know, but after a while he cracked and he actually started crying. And then he confessed the whole thing. 
next the officers waited for young Mrs. Blömers, the housekeeper, to run some errands so that they could get her alone and unprepared. And she had no idea that her brother-in-law had already been arrested. So the police officers confronted her right there in the streets and asked her where Lieutenant Colonel Rose was. And of course, she repeated the same lies. He had left for London. But the inspectors were like, listen, we have your brother-in-law, he already confessed to the murder and he told us everything, we even know where you buried his body. What else could she do than confess and so did Adolf and uh, all three of them were arrested. Not exactly criminal masterminds, this crowd. Thank God. Yeah, seriously. The trial took place in Düsseldorf and it was a spectacle. People swarmed into the courtroom because all three criminals were still young people. And according to the sources, they were rather good looking. And it reminds me of many cases, especially the Mata Mare case. I don't know. It's always so shocking and interesting if the criminals are easy on the eye. It's probably this kind of stark contrast of grisly crime and angelic face that makes these cases so sought after by the public. It gives them proper goosebumps, I suppose. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially something this, this crime was so violent and yeah. so almost just violence for the sake of violence. I mean, it's like Ted Bundy. I don't find Ted Bundy in any way attractive, but many people even back then thought he was a good looking guy. Yeah. And that's what made him so notorious also in a way. Yes, absolutely. Now, all three bloomers were charged for murder, even though the housekeeper insisted that she was only an accomplice, but the judge ruled that it was obvious that Mrs. Blumers was in favor of murdering her employer and therefore is just as guilty as Adolf and Leonard, even though she didn't murder him herself. The fact that she had cancelled the bread delivery well ahead of the crime was evidence enough, and I think they just deemed the baker's apprentice more more trustworthy than, obviously, Mrs. Blumers. Right. The coroner explained how horrible the injuries of Rose had been. The brothers had literally smashed his head in, his whole face had been smashed in, his nose was broken. Yeah, and as I said, he couldn't actually verify if Rose had been alive while cutting the yeah. head. The jury found all three guilty of murder, and they were sentenced to death plus one year in prison for theft which, okay. While Adolf and Leonard Blumers really were executed, Mrs. Blumers' sentence was changed to life in prison because she was expecting another baby. And on a sad note, one of the two Blumers' children, who must have been still very young because the Blumers had just been married for five years, so one of the two children had died during the parents were on trial. Oh, I completely forgot that they had children. Oh, those poor children. Mm. So many victims in this story... It's very, yeah, a lot. And that's it. That's the very sad story of the murder of Lieutenant Colonel Rose. And I know many details were lost over time, but I think it's still a story worth telling. Yeah. Unfortunately, this time I don't even have photos for you. I just couldn't find anything. Nothing. At that time, it would be hard. But wow, what a horrific story. I just can't stop thinking about what made them... How did that happen? You know, it almost seems like the brothers wanted to kill someone and found a reason yeah. to. You know what I mean? Because I think so too. nothing else really makes any sense. If they really, if they truly wanted money, then the housekeeper could have searched the house methodically while doing her duties, right? So it just seems like they wanted to kill someone. Yeah, I I feel the same. And I don't know what kind of person anyway you have to be to not only do this, but do it in this way and cut off a living man's head with a saw. Well, just any kind of torture of that level is a different level. I really think those boys were sociopaths who had a, always yeah. talked about this and it's the only thing that makes sense. Also, Mrs. Blumers, the housekeeper, the younger one, uh, she was very cool. You open the door to a police officer while your husband and your brother-in-law are murdering your employer and you're just like, cool. Yeah. She was the smartest of the three, I think. Yeah, definitely. She at least had the good sense to say, I'm not buying poison if you want me to poison him. Yeah. You wonder, you know, did they find each other because they were both dead inside? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. That mob mentality as well. You know, if you get mm. people of a certain... I don't even know what the word is. No, that's always extremely shocking, right? Because you always think, okay, having one murderer, one cruel, uh, vicious, horrible person, but 
several people finding each other and committing these kind of crimes is always that's the thing is very it like, shocking is like attracted to like in that way you know what i mean you just yeah it's always worse too. the, the cases where there are you know two people working together it's always a little bit more disturbing isn't it because i think we always like to think that this is such an aberration that somebody who would do this is such a such a rare thing so when you find mm. a couple that does it do you know what i mean it's I think it's yeah. even more disturbing to us that, oh, no, there's a lot of them, and they sometimes find each other and work as a team to hurt more people. And Kala that's Hamorka. Exactly. Yep, that would be. Mm. And she's out with a new name, just yeah. living her best life. And that's, I think, the thing that is scary about it, isn't it? Very. Yeah. Yes. No, that was a really sad and interesting story. Now we should talk about more positive things. Do you have something good? Yeah. Um, something good. I am going to be, you're going to laugh when I say that this is something good, but this is my, the more you know moment. It doesn't sound good, but I think when you're hearing this, I will be coming up on my annual colonoscopy. And I know that colonoscopies are something that there's a lot of squeamishness or embarrassment or... I don't know. All those feelings, obviously. I remember the first time I was told I needed one. I was 27 years old and not prepared to have a camera up my bum. But life is life. And um, so, yeah, I'm getting ready. I, I have to have one every year. And I just want to let everybody know how important they are. So if it's your turn to have one, if your doctor's saying it's time, please don't put it off and put it off. They're really important. I think it's really important that we normalize talking about things like checking your breast, checking your testicles, checking any part of your body that needs to be checked, doing it regularly. So let's stop making it something to be embarrassed about and just take care of yourself, please. Yes. Modern medicine is my something good. My something good is my brother. I don't know if I mentioned him before, so I have a brother who is 22 years younger than me. And he is now in... Well, he's 20 now. And we are renovating the house. My husband is not here because he's deployed. He comes home every couple of months. And my brother is helping a lot. Like he and his friend. Because, you know, at 20, they are strong and healthy and oh, can yeah. lift a lot of things. Not like the Blömer's brothers. My brother has... Absolute incredible work ethics, and he's so fast whenever he does something for me, and I'm beyond thankful for his help. So that's my something good. That's amazing. I can't wait to meet your brother and your sister and your mom. I can't wait to meet everybody. It's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be great. I just saw a funny um, 2020 meme that thing video that I have to share. It came up in my memories, but I need to share it to the Facebook group because we always get we get a lot of people in the Facebook group when we get messages from people who are like, I've just been listening to your whole backlog and you're talking about getting together in late 2019, how you're going to meet up in 2020. And I'm so sad. And I'm like, I know, so are we. <laughs> but it's an interesting um, little time capsule of this period in our lives of nothing else. Thank you once again for listening to us. We really appreciate it so much. If you would like to help the show, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. The first is, of course, to tell your friends and family about us. Anyone you think would enjoy our show, recommend us in forums you're in or groups you're in. We really appreciate it. We're also up for podcast awards, so you can vote for us. If you go to podcastawards.com, you will find Fresh Hell Podcast as a category in true crime, female-hosted, and people's choice. So if you would take a minute and go to podcastawards.com and vote for Fresh Hell Podcast, we would be very, very grateful. If you have iTunes, you could leave us a review. If you enjoy our show, we would love it. We love to hear your thoughts, your favorite cases. If you don't care for our show, we can recommend a lot of other free entertainment out there for you. We want to thank you again for 1 million downloads. We are amazed that that's happened. Yes. Absolutely amazed. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can find all the ways to do that on our webpage, which is freshhellpodcast.com, and you will find ways to listen to us, how to mail us, how to email us, 
Anything you need, you should be able to find there. You can find our Facebook group. If you search for Fresh Hell Podcast Murder, or just Fresh Hell Murder, I think it will come up. That is a really, really nice group of people. Sort of my favorite place on the internet right now. What else? Patreon as well. That's the last way that you can support us, and every single donation through Patreon is so appreciated. We are so, so grateful that you are all helping us to make the show better for you, and we're just so grateful. We've got another Patreon game night coming up. We have some fun things planned that in the works that we're working on, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, just thanks again for everything. We are so grateful we have the best listeners thank you yes we absolutely do please tell your pets we said hi all of them tell them we love them tell them we miss them hug them yep cuddle them treat them kindly always treat them res- with respect uh also your fellow human beings please treat them with respect as well give them the benefit of the doubt Yes, always please give people the benefit of the doubt. And if you yourself, like so many of us are, going through hell at the moment. Keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.